Welcome to this series of Lenten talks called Looking Through the Cloister Windows. Lunchtime talks, so do bring your lunch if you happen to want to eat at the same time, you're very welcome to do so. I'm going to say a prayer because today we're going to hear about St. Michael and all angels. Well, St. Michael, not the angels as well, perhaps. So can I say a prayer before we begin? Then I'm going to hand over to George Brooke, who is chairing this session. So let us pray. Everlasting God, you have ordained and constituted the ministries of angels and mortals in a wonderful order. Grant that as your holy angels always serve you in heaven, so at your command, they may help and defend us on earth. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, George, over to George, you. Oh, so thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I think uh, you need to make sure you are muted throughout the talk. So if you can mute yourselves, that would be very helpful. Each year uh, at this time, the Dean uh, invites me to put together a series of talks for uh, Lent or the spring. And uh, last year, the talks were organized to fit with the 100th anniversary of the installation of Dean Bennett as Dean of Chester in 1920. And uh, uh, we chose to focus on one particular feature uh, of his uh, deanship, which was his project to glaze the cloister windows. Uh, we had three talks and then were interrupted by lockdown. Uh, so this year we are uh, having a series of five talks to finish the set. Um, so the choice of topic uh, has rested with each individual speaker, uh, but we are um, uh, looking forward to uh, investigating five windows uh, over the next few weeks. If you want to do some further research, uh, there are three things uh, you can chase up. Uh, the first is that the Cathedral Library has an exhibition uh, closed at the moment but being extended perhaps beyond the uh, lockdown limits uh, on Dean Bennett and the catalogue for that exhibition is on the cathedral website under the library page. Uh, in addition, uh, Jen Stratford uh, has just completed a wonderful uh, editing um, of a rather ponderous George Brook talking about uh, the uh, exhibition and that's on the cathedral youtube site it's a 30 minute guide to the exhibition uh, about dean bennett and thirdly uh, there is on the cathedral website a complete uh, inventory of the cloister windows called a gallery of saints it's available in two volumes and if you're wanting to follow through uh, with some of the details of the windows, I do recommend that you consult the uh, magnificent product of a, a team uh, who uh, finished their work uh, last summer. Uh, so to start us off in uh, this series, uh, we have the um, uh, Archdeacon of Chester, uh, Michael Gilbertson. Uh, Michael, it seemed to me uh, it was a very good place to start uh, because of his name. And there is indeed a St. Michael window. Uh, we're looking forward very much to what he has to say. Uh, Michael's revised 1997 Durham doctoral thesis was published in 2003 as God and History in the Book of Revelation, New Testament Studies in Dialogue with Pannenberg and Maltman. So popular was it that a paperback was issued in 2008. Um, in this uh, book, uh, 
in light of debates about the relationship between history and faith, Michael looked at ways of approaching the book of Revelation with chapters particularly on space and time. And perhaps that's going to be the matrix for angels such as Michael. Uh, welcome, Michael. Uh, we look forward very much to uh, listening to what you have to say to us. Thank you very much, George. I'll try to live up to that billing. I'm not sure I'm, uh, I also feel a slight uh, uh, fraud talking about this sort of territory with George on the screen. I'm sure George uh, may be willing to answer all the difficult questions at the end. Um, but uh, it's lovely to see you all uh, here today. I'm, I do have some PowerPoint slides, which I'm going to share. I hope you can, um, I hope you'll be able to see them. Are you able to see that on screen? Yes. Yes, good. Good. Well, as George uh, said in his, his kind words of introduction, today we are looking at uh, one of the uh, windows, one of the lights of one of the windows that were commissioned by Dean Bennett, um, uh, who was Dean uh, of Chester from uh, 1920 to 1937. And as George says, there's an excellent introduction to all the windows and details pictures of them um, online. And today it's St. Michael. Um, the 29th of September, the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels. And uh, we, uh, there's the, the picture uh, looking through into the cloister garth to remind us of the context, the setting of these wonderful windows. Here is St. Michael himself, the window, uh, the, the window for the 29th of September. Um, we'll come back to the, the, the window in a little bit more detail later on. But St. Michael appears in a, a, a set of four lights in one window, four archangels, Michael, Raphael, Uriel, and Gabriel. And uh, the 29th of September, as I said, the feast of St. Michael and all angels um, in, the, in the Church of England and in some other churches as well. Some of you might know that the, uh, the word angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. And there are many references in the Bible to angels as messengers visiting people sent from God to bring important messages. Uh, we also read of angels uh, being there as a praising God. Uh, we also read of angels coming to protect God's people. And we read of angels delivering God's judgment as well. Important intermediaries in different ways between God and humanity. Uh, if you were in church, um, in person or online uh, on Sunday, uh, you might have you might remember that the gospel reading um, from uh, the first chapter of Mark was about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Uh, he was in the wilderness for forty days. It says tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. So we were reminded in our gospel reading on Sunday of the activities of angels uh, in that in that um, context, uh, waiting on helping Christ in the wilderness. Uh, if you were in the cathedral online on Sunday, you would have also sung the hymn 40 days and 40 nights. And uh, so on the first the first Sunday of Lent, we often sing that hymn and it reminds us of uh, the idea of angels protecting us today not just in the days uh, of Jesus's ministry. Uh, one of the uh, couple of the lines from that great hymn, so shall we have peace divine 
holier gladness ours shall be. Round us too shall angels shine, such as ministered to thee. So a hymn addressed to Christ and um, uh, expressing confidence that although we can't usually see them, God's angels are doing their work today. Some angels are more preeminent than others. And uh, I've mentioned um, archangels and these four in the window here, Michael uh, thought of um, often as the protector of God's people, the leader of the heavenly armies. And we're going to come back to him. Raphael, the second uh, angel um, associated particularly with healing. Uriel, the bringer of light and Gabriel, the messenger. And uh, you'll obviously be I guess, familiar with the story of Gabriel coming to visit the Virgin Mary at the Annunciation. And uh, we, we, we won't look at Raphael and Uriel and Gabriel in detail, but they own, all of those lights in the window have their own particular symbolism associated with those angels. Uh, this window of four lights with four angels was, was designed by Frederick Charles Eden who was responsible for many of the windows in the Chester cloisters. He began uh, as an, a, a, an architect. He trained under a very eminent uh, Victorian church architect called G.F. Bodley, uh, who was responsible for designing, amongst other things, uh, St. Mary's Church in Eccleston, which uh, uh, some of you will know, not far from Chester. Um, and that Eden himself did design some churches, mainly in the southeast of England, and he designed a cathedral indeed in Tanganyika, but he came to focus more on church fittings, including stained glass. And there are fine examples in the Chester cloisters, including this one. The name Michael, whom I'm privileged to be christened with as well, means who is like God, who is like God. And here is Michael uh, from the, the that light from the window in the cathedral cloisters. Um, you'll see that he has a halo and that on the top of his head there are flames. Uh, we think this is a reference to Psalm 104 verse 4, you make the winds your messengers fire and flame your ministers. We'll come back to the detail of the of the picture in a minute. But before we do that, I want you to take you a long way away from the cloisters at Chester Cathedral. I want to take you to a page from the London Gazette of the 23rd of November 1915. This is a formal notice of uh, a list of young officers who are being commissioned as second lieutenants after their training at Sandhurst. And there are three from the Cheshire Regiment. Uh, the Cheshire Regiment, of course, uh, closely associated with this cathedral. And you can see that in the Garden of Remembrance and elsewhere. And uh, one of them is Gordon Ralph Troughton Dean. Uh, he was the second son of four sons born to James and Ethel Dean, who by that time actually were, were divorced, we understand. Um, he, at this point, was just 18 years old. So you can imagine... Uh, these days, imagine these days um, uh, coming out of the Royal Military College aged just 18 as a second lieutenant and your life um, unfolding before you, all the aspirations and ambitions he, he must have had. He went into the uh, first battalion of the, uh, the Cheshire Regiment. Uh, he survived the First World War. Uh, we know that the first battalion of the Cheshire's fought at Arras and at Passchendaele in 1917. Um, he, he lived through all of that, but very sadly, as we can learn from the, the uh, inscription at the bottom of the window, 
He died in 1923. He was shot by accident near Lucknow in India in July 1923, shortly after his 26th birthday. And the window is in his memory uh, with a quotation from uh, Psalm 16, in thy presence is the fullness of joy. So behind this uh, wonderful window of St. Michael is this tragic story of a soldier dying young, aged just 26. And there at the bottom of the window is the mention of his name, uh, where he died and when, and also you'll find in the window the badge of the Cheshire Regiment. Now, Michael is a particularly appropriate memorial in this case, and I hope you'll see that as we as we go on. What do we know about St. Michael? Well, we encounter St. Michael in three places in the Bible. Uh, first of all, we come across him in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel has been fervently praying and uh, he, his prayers are answered when an angel um, appears. Um, the angel says, however, that it's taken him a long time to get to Daniel. He set off from heaven at the time that Daniel began to pray, and it took him 21 days to get there because he was opposed on the way by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Um, there seems to have been some sort of supernatural um, uh, battle going on involving supernatural forces. And he only got there because Michael came to help him. And so here, Daniel 10, 12 to 14, this is the angel speaking. Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. So Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I left him there with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And I have come to help you understand what is to happen to your people at the end of days. And um, so there is a, 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 a little snapshot, a little indication of a, of a, a well grounded um, uh, belief that you often come across in scripture of somehow um, a struggle going on in the supernatural realm, somehow paralleling what is going on on earth. And so this, this conflict that this messenger came from, uh, leaving Michael to continue the fight and was able to come to answer Daniel's prayer. And then a couple of chapters later in Daniel 12, Michael appears again. Um, at that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. A time of tribulation and persecution. Um, George would be uh, better able to give you the details of this. We think this is probably a reference to when the book of Daniel was probably written in the second century BC, uh, when the children of Israel were being, the, the, the Jewish people were being persecuted by a, a ruler called Antiochus. Um, but this sense of uh, tribulation and persecution and Michael, the great prince, the angel coming to protect God's people. And notice that the people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book. That's a motif that we see um, quite a few times um, in scripture. Um, and uh, of course it does appear in the book of Revelation. Um, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? That's the first time that we come across Michael in scripture in the book of Daniel. We then appear, we then come across him in, in the, the short letter of Jude, all, almost at the end of the New Testament. In Jude verse 9, there is reference to this strange um, story, this um, it was a, a tradition um, that the archangel Michael contended with Satan 
for the body of Moses. And that was an old uh, Jewish story of Satan trying to accuse Moses of a serious crime of murder so that he wouldn't be worthy of an honorable burial. And Michael came and resisted that and ensured that Moses got a decent burial. It's a reference to that in, in, in the letter of Jude. And then, as George mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, there is battle in heaven. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. It's not actually the end of the dragon uh, who represents Satan in the book of Revelation. He does appear later on in the text, but this is a decisive moment in the story when certainly he's thrown down from heaven and his power is seen to be on the wane. I've included there uh, one of Albrecht Dürer's famous woodcuts illustrating the book of Revelation. And you can see there Michael um, uh, uh, defeating uh, Satan, the dragon. And you can see, you might just be able to see um, Satan's head looking upwards at Michael. That's a famous um, image. And uh, you may well have seen a similar image in the statue on the wall of Coventry Cathedral, St. Michael overcoming Satan and uh, Satan being thrown down from heaven. So in all of these pictures from scripture, Michael comes to be seen as the protector of God's people and in some circles as well, particularly the protector of soldiers. Uh, here we are back with the window um, in Chester Cathedral. Archangels are often portrayed carrying a staff. And uh, Michael's staff has become a flaming sword in this window. Uh, perhaps a reference to uh, the, the, the image in Genesis chapter three, if you remember where Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden and uh, a, cherub a cherubim uh, is, is there with a flaming sword to prevent them coming back in. Also, there might be a, a reference here to, uh, to the sword of Michael um, mentioned in Paradise Lost. Um, I'm just going to read a few lines from Paradise Lost. Um, uh, Michael's sword wounds uh, Satan. And so you can see that uh, if we're thinking about Revelation 12 and, and Michael being the protector of his people and the one who contends against Satan when he's trying to attack God's people, uh, this is particularly appropriate, particularly apposite. Uh, here are the lines. But the sword of Michael from the armory of God was given him tempered so that neither keen nor solid might resist that edge. It met the sword of Satan with steep force to smite, descending, and in half cut sheer, nor stayed, but with swift wheel, reverse, deep entering, shared all his right side. Then Satan first knew pain, and writhed him to and fro convolved, so saw the griding sword with discontinuous wound, passed through him. So uh, with this sword, Michael uh, Michael attacks and wounds Satan. Actually, Satan recovers from that, but Christ arrives to win the day. And a lot of that is, is that imagery and, and that idea of, of Michael being the protector of his people and the one who contends against Satan is picked up in um, a lot of prayers. Here is the collect for um, St. Michael and All Angels Day, which uh, Jane actually read to us at the beginning of our session today. Everlasting God, you have ordained and constituted the ministries of angels and mortals in a wonderful order. Grant that as your holy angels always serve you in heaven, so, at your command, they may help and defend us on earth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Here's a more 
explicit prayer. This is one of the Leonine prayers that were instituted by Leo XIII in the Roman Catholic Church in the 1880s and were used through until the 1960s <clears throat> until they were banned. I think they're probably still used in some quarters, but they were said after mass. And uh, this is a prayer to St. Michael himself. And uh, it's, it's very vivid. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the malice and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do you, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. So Michael comes to be seen as the protector of God's people and the one who contends against Satan on behalf of God's people, on behalf of God. He's also associated particularly with receiving the souls of the dead. And that comes, doesn't it, from a, a couple of those um, parish, uh, the, um, passages that we looked at in Scripture. The, 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 that passage from the letter of Jude, where um, uh, Michael is there uh, contending over the body of Moses. And then in Daniel 12, where he's associated with God's people um, being saved, depending on whether their, book, their, their name is written in the book. And from that comes the tradition, um, an old tradition, that St. Michael was the one who um, ferried souls across the River Jordan when people died. I'm sure many of you have come across the spiritual Michael row the boat ashore, um, if you've ever wondered what on earth that means, um, it, this is probably where it comes from. Um, and that that song was first noted by by somebody um, uh, collecting songs, who's a, actually a, a, um, an, an abolitionist, who discovered it being sung on St. Helena Island in South Carolina during the American Civil War, being sung by slaves and ex-slaves. And so the idea is that Michael rowing the boat ashore is an echo of that tradition of Michael um, ferrying the souls of the righteous to heaven um, after their death, after death. And if, if you look at some of the original versions of that song, they go on to say things like um, looking forward to seeing my mother when I get to the other side. So a, a sense of being reunited with other family members who have previously died. And so Michael is the protector of individuals against Satan at the hour of their death, as well as being the protector of God's people in that more general sense. And if we look further down the window, um, we find Michael carrying this set of scales. Uh, you can see on the left there are three uh, righteous souls, and on the right, uh, two demons, and uh, they're being weighed in the balance against each other. And of course, the implication of that is that the is that the uh, demons are being weighed and found wanting, and the righteous are being weighed and found to be saved, to be acceptable in God's sight. Um, and that idea of souls being weighed is a common image in medieval art. So Michael is a very appropriate for the, uh, the, the, the setting of this uh, particular memorial, commending that young man, Gordon Dean, into God's safekeeping, and appropriate for the memorial of a soldier in particular, as we think about St. Michael, the protector of God's people and the leader of the heavenly host. Back to the collect from uh, common worship for St. Michael and all angels on the 29th of um, September. I'm just going to say that once more. Everlasting God, you have ordained and constituted the ministries of angels and mortals in a wonderful order. 
grant that as your holy angels always serve you in heaven, so at your command they may help and defend us on earth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And a last look at the whole picture of St Michael from the windows with the, the flames from his head, his halo, his flaming sword, the scales that he's carrying, an archangel protecting God's people. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Um, it sounds to me like uh, there we've got the job spec for an archdeacon, protecting God's people, uh, but not being uh, afraid of uh, weighing them in the scales and finding some wanting, perhaps. Um, yes, armed with a flaming sword as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, we have a few minutes for some questions. So um, we have 54 people attending. Uh, you can either send me a, a, a message in the chat box or uh, try and wave and I will flick backwards and forwards. Uh, please unmute yourself if you're wishing to ask a question. I'm just saying, it's not just questions, George. I think if, if people have their own thoughts and comments about um, St. Michael or angels as well, it would be good to hear them. Certainly. Jane, Jane Jones. Um, Michael, I, it's never struck me before about um, St. Michael being referred to as Prince rather than an archangel or an angel. And I'm, I'm really interested, can you say a little bit about this sort of hierarchy? <clears throat> Princes, archangels, angels, how they all fit together? <clears throat> He's only referred to as an archangel, I think. Uh, what and archangels generally are referred to more than once in scripture, but Michael is specifically referred to as an archangel in Jude. Um, we don't know really, Jane, um, other than uh, references like that one in Daniel, where clearly the implication is that Daniel is a superior angel to the one who's been sent to give Daniel the message. Um, and there are descriptions, uh, I mean, George talked in the in uh, about the book of revelation um at the very beginning there are descriptions of of angels that are described as being of an enormous size or being mighty angels standing on the land and on the sea and reaching right up to heaven and so on um and uh so uh, is this a, a, a sense of a, 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 a some angels really displaying great might and power whereas some descriptions of angels in scripture are almost as though they're they're, they're on a much more human scale and are, are, are almost as if God had simply sent a, a human being almost to, to to deliver a message. Um, so I, I can't go into great detail about what what the what the precise kind of gradations are in 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 uh, sort of angelic orders, except that there has been a lot of sort of speculation of, about this down the centuries. George might know a little bit more about this than, than, than I do. Um, uh, I, I have read, for example, that um, it, it, it was proposed that St. Michael might have been the, the prince or the leader of one of the lower orders of angels, which doesn't seem to, um, uh, that doesn't seem to gel with with what we read in scripture where he's described as being quite a a, a, a mighty force and and uh the the really the one entrusted with uh the, the really difficult missions by god but i but i'm, I'm afraid um, any anything more than that is rather speculative i don't know whether you you have any wisdom on that george uh, well of course um i think the traditions are quite fluid uh, in antiquity uh, 200 years before the book of Revelation, in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, we have descriptions of the Prince of Light, who is struggling against Belial, or Belia, as he's called uh, by St. Paul, uh, 
who is Satan. Um, and most scholars have identified that Prince of Light, hence the name Prince there, uh, with Michael, um, that there is this uh, heavenly struggle going on, uh, just as in the book of Revelation, a heavenly struggle, which kind of uh, is the counterpart to uh, what's going on uh, on earth. It is interesting that in, in some circles, I think it's been, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure quite what to make of this, but, but it, um, some have suggested that Michael is a picture of the of, of the pre-incarnate Christ, um, and so uh, that's that's the form in which Jesus ap ap appears before he's born in Bethlehem. I'm I'm not sure about that myself, but but uh, I, I've seen that suggested. Chris Chesham, you have a question. Yes, I wonder if Michael could clarify, please, about the the prayer to Saint Michael. Did you say it had been abolished or something? I couldn't quite understand because it, it is still <laughs> prayed, and you can still quite openly buy copies of it as prayer cards and so forth. Sorry, I, I, I banned was probably the wrong word. I think it was. Uh, I think the um, the Vatican sort of discouraged its use in the nineteen sixties. Um, but but I'm sure it's still used, um, and uh, and as you say, you can still buy it. Um, but it was particularly used between the 1880s and the 1960s, um, and I think pro possibly at the time of, of of liturgical reform around the Second Vatican Vatican Council and so on, um, it was it was I think frowned upon. Um, but uh, but. I mean, a, a lot of people would still use it and still find it a helpful prayer. I, uh, I accept that. So, if if you if you have that on a card, and you and you want to pray it, um, I'm I'm not sure that you're kind of transgressing anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim, Tim has a question. Thanks, George. Uh, 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 Mike, I, I wonder whether you would encourage us or not to derive any meaning for ourselves from this? Uh, and if so, how? Is it through events in some sort of historical fashion um, or is this through some parabolic means or, or, or where's, the, where's the meaning if there is any? The meaning of which part? The meaning of angels generally or? Yeah, how when we uh, read and think of figures like Michael, might there be meaning for us? I is think I think I think there is there is meaning in different ways, uh, Tim, which can be sort of grounded in 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 daily life. Which I I I, I mentioned briefly at the beginning, um, but perhaps skimmed over rather. That the functions that angels serve in Scripture. Uh, as being the, 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 those orders of angels who are there praising God in heaven, bringing messages, protecting God's people and executing judgment, give a sense for us of, um, of, of there being uh, uh, forces that we can't see, which are nonetheless uh, working for God's good purposes in the world. Um, George talked a little bit about my um, my book, uh, which I think you probably can still buy in paperback or in Kindle versions or something if you if you really desperate. But uh, the argument of that book was that, that, that the book of Revelation is about extending our horizons so that what we see and hear in the everyday is not all there is. So both sort of looking forward to the ultimate future and looking at the whole of reality, including heaven and earth, uh, gives us a bigger perspective and helps us to situate ourselves in God's story and God's action. It's interesting, I was, uh, we, we've just been running in the diocese a, um, a, a, an eight-week course um, called Fruitfulness on the Front Line, which is all about everyday discipleship and people being Christian witnesses in their homes, their workplaces, their schools, their, their neighbourhoods, 
uh, Monday to Saturday. And uh, last night was the last one. And um, the Mark Green from the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity was was on on film to sort of summarising some of what we we we'd we'd been thinking about over the, the the previous eight weeks, and the particular Bible passage that he alighted on was from Two Kings when um, uh, uh, Elisha um, and his servant are um, uh, uh, there being opposed by. Uh, the king of Aram, and it's it, uh, Elisha is, a, is in a tight spot because the the king of Aram is out to to get him. Um, and uh, uh, Elisha prays that the servant's eyes would be open and see. And then, if you remember the if you remember the story, uh, th there's a, a vision of an enormous kind of heavenly army of flaming chariots and horsemen and so on all around the, the the hills where they are and that was that was a story that mark green chose to illustrate the fact that in our daily christian life now uh god is at work to protect us uh and to and to uh, uh, uh work his his work his purposes out that's where we are and, and and i think that that in a sense that's uh that that's something of what angels are about it's a it's a kind of reassurance of of god working uh, uh in and around us um in in ways that that perhaps just add to the picture um uh, more than if we were simply thinking about God and uh, uh, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the fact that there are uh, creatures uh, working for God who we can't see is somehow uh, reassuring and inspiring. I don't know whether that helps, but that's that's the sort of thing that I that that I would say in response to that question. Thank you. That's that's good. Thank you. Uh, we have just uh, two minutes left. Uh, so there's a chance for Jezza to make a comment. Jezza. Are you there, Jezza? I can't see you on. That's it. Yeah. Ah. So just, just very quickly, please. Yeah. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Gilbertson, thank you very much. It was very exciting. It's a wonderful presentation. But I wanted to ask you about Raphael and Uriel because they're not mentioned in my Bible. It, I guess they're in the Apocrypha. <laughs> what do you know about those two? Yeah, R R Raphael is uh, is the uh, archangel particularly associated with healing. And uh, he's mentioned in the Apocrypha, in the book of Tobit particularly. Um, and uh, th there's a story there of um, a, a, a ointment being from a fish yes. in healing. Yes. And, uh, if you look at that light of the window in the cloisters, uh, uh, Raphael is carrying a fish, mm -hmm. and so and and um, and so yes, he's not not in the Old Testament or the New Testament, um, but. Uh, but there, so I think the, the the two who are mentioned in the Old and New Testaments are Michael and Gabriel. Gabriel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, perhaps this is a, a subject for uh, another course okay. uh, to deal with <laughs> angels of all sorts and all your yeah. larger questions. Um, Michael, thank you so much indeed. And um, I've always wondered what it's like having a question as a name. Uh, who is like God, whether you feel you're constantly going around feeling questioned by your own name. But yeah. uh, we'll leave that again for another course. And who is more impressive at, at uh, attacking dragons? Is it Michael or is it George? That's... <laughs> oh, yeah. We can have a discussion. <laughs> um, so thank you all very much for attending. Uh, next week, uh, Professor William Horbury uh, will be with us to reflect on ideas of the saints from the Psalms to Everest, 1924, um, using the St. Bernard window as a, a, a launch pad. 
So thank you very much and see you next week.